Hello, this is Hakuta Bean, and today, well, I just finished my debut, but it turns out my Wi-Fi cannot handle while streaming too well, so we're going to go ahead and do a video so I can have some, at least somewhat decent quality content around here. So today we are going to be reading the intro for something called the Belliverse. It's an SCP canon where the world ends for some reason or another, and the and for some reason SCPs are known but also not known. We'll get into it and figure out what it's really all about when we get into it. If you like this video, please leave a like on the video, comment down below, and subscribe to the channel. Let's get into this. Welcome to the end of the world. Well, not the world as such. Planet Earth spinning by just as well as its sun for the past few billion years. It's not even the end of life on Earth. Sure, there have been some extinctions, but plenty of animals are still kicking. <clears throat> Like rabbits, dingoes, and dolphins. Hi, dolphins! Really calling the mere extinction of 99.99997% of humanity in the end of the world is pretty melodramatic when you think about it. So call it the end of the world as we know it. All civilization was, was wiped out. Every last human on Earth died. There was nobody left. Except... Earth isn't the only place humans can be. The Foundation had a hideaways prepared for just this possibility. And so a few thousand human researchers, agents, and classy personnel were spared the disaster. And after a short time, they came out and looked at the world that was left. They were based out of Site-23. A few stragglers from other places, other hideaways, is arrived, but Site-23 had the largest population base of survivors, so it became the new home of, of mankind. And civilization started anew, with the Foundation in charge. Oh my, they knew that a lot of things would be nest. Uh, things would have nest necessity be lost. It's unlikely they suspected how much. So they worked on making things safe for their descendants. The classes were set to work rebuilding with various control, also advised by Dr. Man and Dr. Wright. While strike teams led by the likes of, Do of Clef, Strakonov, and Kondraki cleared out new threats. Because of the SP universe, there were there are worse things in Australia than dingoes. There are monsters, anomalies, and all sorts of unpleasantness. Grad Gradually, they made the land not safe. They are not be safe, not for many, many years, but safe enough. But there were costs to be paid. Site 23 was lost when SCP-682 arrived. To trap the creature, they used SCP-184, the architect, to get lost in endless tunnels. But Agent and Stronikov as bait. Other researchers were, were driven out. Man, Kudraki, others too, even the ones who stayed were changed. They used anomalous items more readily. It was a point of protecting society when society was already destroyed. There were fights, splinter groups. Much of the people were split into warring tribes, and more and more knowledge of the past was lost. That was thousands of years ago. History has faded into legend. The researchers and agents who saved humanity became the common pantheon of the new religion, with variations throughout the land. Geography Geography is still fairly loose, with few defined places. Most of the continent is much greener than, greener than it was in our time. The climates change greatly, and there are plains, forests, even rainforests. 
where there was once only desert. Civilization varies greatly from one place to another, ranging from tribes hardly into the Bronze Age to the city people to the east, who are now firmly into the Iron Age, with a few having discovered the secret of steel. The city people leave, live, as their name and suggests, in city states. The war, trade, they war, trade, make alliances, and generally make fathers of themselves. They are more willing than the tribesmen to raid the old ruins for treasure, though it's still considered a very dangerous cursed enterprise. They've rediscovered the principles of agriculture. They're starting to expand, but there's still a great deal of empty land in the east, meaning they haven't expanded into other territories much yet. The tribesmen live throughout the rest of the continent and are a very lot. Some of them are nomadic, while others have permanent and settlements. They tend to avoid old ruins and places where strange things live. That said, they're also much more likely to encounter such things. It's not unusual to find a tribesman selling his services to the city people. There are also people inhabiting the islands around Australia. Humans aren't anywhere near taking their planet back, but they've taken their first steps, whether or not they succeed. Oh, and a note to the people. It was a pretty buried lot who survived in Site-23, and they've been living for several thousand years in Australia. Selective pressures have dug in their skin pretty well. There's still some variation in hair or in eye color, but almost everyone has darker skin. I don't see why that matters, but okay. And there's one important place. No one, not say people, not tribesmen, will go to the south willingly. That's the home of the Evermen. It is patrolled by the Walking Dead, the New Men, and other monsters he's collected over the years. You can probably guess who these are based off of. The Pantheon, the senior staff of the previous times are the gods of the new ones. Some of them did at their damnedest to earn their titles, others just did their job, but they're remembered now. Geir, the god of smithing and technology, and the chief of the gods. It said in some tribes that he constructed the old cities and then destroyed them when they didn't please him. This is especially common among tribesmen who think any city is sinful in old Geir's eyes. Drakgin, the god of battle and war, in some places he's, he's praised as a god of, for heroes, and they ask him for strength, in others he's an evil god who brought discord into the world. Some whisper that the a dragon, Sekate, was his pet or his seed. Some say he destroyed the old world in a powerful rage. Kalef, the god of the underworld, the righteous dead will go to him on their final day. He rules a vast empire underground, on an opal throne. He is also the god of riches. He is known to offer mortals bargains. However, he has a way of twisting them to his own advantage. Letus, I mean Leda, the goddess of nature. She guards the forests and fields. She is worshipped by hunters and guides through the wilderness and many of the tribesmen. Her totem is a tooth owl. Eretis, or Old Aggie. The name differs from place to place, but she's always worshipped as a goddess of fertility. Farmers build shrines to her in their fields, and the city is her temples offer the services of priestesses to lonely men. Avert, the god of death, but the righteous is dead when God to collect. The wicked are averts. When someone dies, they first visit of Earth's realm, where they are judged. York, the saint of thieves, tricksters, and liars. York stole the, stole the secret of iron from the gods, planted it among the mortals, and then tricked both to pay him to find a culprit. Some say the end was his doing, a trick gone far wrong. Sorel, Sorel is not a god, but the first king. He fought the dragon and took it in the homes Saito. Saitu, and both were sealed to protect the world. 
It said that one day when men need you know most, he will emerge from the home site to who unite the people and bring about a golden age. <sighs> There are also numerous local gods. Sometimes I replace gods from the pantheon. Sometimes I simply supply it. Each trap, I have each city has its own local version of the pantheon, its own version of events. This is the most general form of the pantheon. Wonders and Monsters. These are SCP objects, essentially. These are things like the waiting pool, the architect, the surgeon crabs. I mean, the architect gets still locked with at the um, unkillable lizard. Wonders are the magic items of the Bellaverse. They are relatively rare, but that doesn't mean they're unheard of. Most city states have a few locked up by the powerful and wealthy. This is why we should be eating them. Anyway, they can be found in ruins or in a bit and in situs. The survivors brought a great number of them to Australia while they still had transportation. Monsters are, well, monsters. They're SCP creatures. Imagine the Heart of Darkness being encountered by a group of guardsmen from one of the city nights. The Heart of Darkness? Or a group of enters from a tribe. They're dangerous. Be creative. Ask what SCP might be interesting for them to encounter. Remember that the SCP Foundation hasn't locked away all anomalies. Feel free to invent something. If it fits the story, hey, maybe you have an SCP idea that you can't make work in an article. Use it here. Done. Okay, now we're getting to the most important part. That is basically a dying earth setting in tone. It's an old setting that was once great and prosperous, but I'll try it low. Unlike most dying earth settings, this one's actually recovering, but it's the same things as a survival of wonders from the old world and rooting on the new. It's sword and sorcery in an old world. Look to Vantus Hugo or Libris. Faffer and the Grey Mouser. It's cynical, but the promise of exploration, the sense of wonder that comes with a strange world. I think a better example would be Adventure Time. Maybe. Maybe the Thousand Years in the Future version? I'm not sure though. Okay. We can read the list of wonders before we get into anything else. The beller walked through the waste, leaving no tracks. He was a tall, lanky man with black hair and beady eyes. He wore a blue jacket over a red skirt of patches and rags, with a small, tongueless bell at his throat, but and a ring with the sign of York, the patron of Saint, of a patron saint of the patron saint of thieves and rogues. Beller wasn't his real name, of course, but he made a have have to never tell. He made it have it never to tell anyone his real name. He said it was because his people were afraid to give up their own names, but people assumed he was wanted the name when he was born with. He was certain he was certainly wanted enough under his new one, and unwanted in some places. He knew the ways, though. If anyone could get you from one city to another, it was him. Extra, uh, if he'd been cast, outcast by the locals. If you wanted a relic from the old places, he knew where you could buy it, or if the price was right, he'd fetch you one from on his, himself. The wire skin at his side was empty, water was plentiful in the waste, and it was one less thing to weigh him down. The real problem was food, nothing grew in the waste. There were occasional birds and animals crossing the damp sands, but no trees or grasses of any sort. The beller knew the waste well. He'd use it was its trackless, and spaces to escape pursuit many times. Today, however, he was looking for someone else. In the distance, a rocky, 
Oh, Montari poked up over the dune, like the back of a beetle. He'd spotted it the day before. He would reach it in a few more hours. Oh, Bella! A voice called out. The Bella tense, reaching for his sword. He relaxed after he spotted a man on top of Dune, wearing a thick leather rose. Benadam, I've come to visit you. The man began watching in that. You know what? Actually, is more like better example than even Adventures I Want to Rest the Wild. I just saw that. Wow. That took me way too long to think of, but yeah. No rod or maybe even more Tears of the Kingdom. More freedom, you know? Nah, yeah, too. Rest the Wild makes more sense. Right after an apocalypse. Red began walking down the dune to the beller. He smiled, his blue eyes almost seeming to shine from under the leather skullcap worn low over his forehead. I thought as much. I saw you yesterday. What brings you here? I found some writings, and I want you to tell me what they mean, the beller said. He got up a box with the handle. Oh, he'd found. He found it across the world after he tried to rob a wizard's home and fell victim to an enchanted pool. A briefcase full of secrets, Benadam said. I'm surprised it's so intact. Well, follow me. I've out of a small camp and we can speak more there. This is how it always went with, with, with Benadam. He always met them. Other within a day of the rocks with the campsite set up. The Valor had never been to the rocks themselves. They didn't know anyone who had. Benadam looked to be in his middle years. But he'd been in the ways as long as Valor had heard. Some said he was as old as the ways. Yes, itself. He certainly knew it enough of the lost days. The hermit led him up to Ooh, the dune into his small tent, made from leather and with the bones of some great beast for supports. There was a small metal contraption with fire rising from it. So let's look at your case, the hermit said, reaching for the case with his leather, leather gloves. He opened the clasp with hardly a glance, though it had taken the beller several minutes to figure out. He pulled out the papers, yellow and brittle, and began to read them over. He sucked in his breath and asked, Where did you find this? In a fortress built into a mountain far across the sea, the beller said. <clears throat> One of the fortresses of the old order. He could hardly keep it, the excitement from his voice. There were other relics there, but this was the only thing I could carry easily. How did you get across the sea? Benedict M asked. Never mind, do you realize what you have? Secrets, the beller said, smiling. The hermit's reaction to all of the papers were important. You could say that? The Benedict M said, slowly nodding. This is a list of wonders. I suppose you could say... And the location of the Saitus. Including the home Saitu? Beller asked hungrily. Then I'm, I'm straightened suddenly. Beller, no! You don't know what's in there. It was banned for a reason. I'm not afraid. I've been in Saitus before. The Beller puffed up his narrow chest. Not like this one. I won't let you do it, Van Damme said. Don't try to stop me, old man. Just tell me where the Saitu is. The Beller grabbed the hermit's wrist and it felt hard and thin under his, under his sleeve. As though there were nothing in there but bone. Van Damme did not move, and his expression never changed, but something changed in him, as though he had suddenly grown larger. The hairs on the back of Beller's neck rose. There was a sense of power in the air, as though lightning were about to strike. Will you strike me? the hermit asked. 
The fellow took his hand from Venom, and he looked away, embarrassed despite himself. I'm going to put an end. To this nonsense, Van Damme said. He put the papers over the fire, and they caught at once. You should thank me. I've saved you from yourself, you know. He suddenly boiled up inside the beller. He hated being ate, ate a fool of, and couldn't resist one last bloody mo note. You haven't changed anything, he said. What do you mean? Van Damme asked, suspicious. Do you think I would make this journey with only the original set of papers? As far as I say were, I'd, I've had time to make a dozen sets and I've hidden them all. In truth, he'd only taken the time to make one copy and it was in his bag, but Van Damme didn't know that. Beller, you can't do this. I won't let you, Vandem rose, and for a moment the Beller thought he might attack. You won't stop me, the Beller said with a bravado he didn't feel. You're no murderer. Vandem stared at him for a long moment, and then, to the Beller's surprise, he burst out laughing. Oh, Beller, if only you knew. No, I won't kill you, but not for the reasons you think. Go on, then. I cannot stop you. But I know how you expect to follow the notes when you cannot read them. I'll find another who knows the old language, Abella said. There's no one else, Vandem said. I'm the only one who still remembers it. Not true. Abella said. There's one other, and he's not hard to find. Who? Oh, Bella, you don't mean to go south, do you? The Vandem's eyes turned to pity. If you will not help me, then I have no choice. I'll go... I'd go to Everett himself if he offered me the homicide to. Van Damme sh only shook his head. It's not death you should be afraid of in the Everman's hands. Hmm. Bella kept his fire or small, and watch the entrance out to the cave. He was a week out of the waste, and there was something moving outside. It was too big to be a wild dog, and didn't move quite right to be a jumper. It could be another traveler, of course, or a bandit, but he hadn't seen anyone for two days. The south was a cursed land, everyone knew that. Twigs cracked near the entrance, and a human shape blocked the light. By blank eyes, stared at him in a low moan, Oh, that was like John. Unmouth. Gears Forge, he swore, raising his or the, the Walking Dead were only a nuisance in the open. But their slow speed and clumsy movements made them uneasy to a kill. In the cramped confines of the cave, however, he was at a serious risk of a bite. Someone torrented him, inadvertently stepping into the fire. Then seemed to react as the flame climbed up its leg. They only stepped onward, reaching for him with gray, bloated fingers. The veiler swung his sword at the hands, taking off the fingers. He tried to step around a dead man to and get to the entrance, but stumbled over and grabbed onto his shoulder of his unmaimed hand. He kicked out, trying to keep it from catching fire himself. He knocked his leg out from under it. The dead end man fell, nearly pulling him down with it. He managed to get free before he could sink his teeth into his leg.
Oh, great, sorry. He turned back and it began to crawl towards him. He jogged out of the cave. The rock had got himself on another daring escape. Now he merely had to wait until the dead man came out, and it would be easily dispatched. As he turned, his smile slowly sank. The crawling dead was hoisting itself through the dead leaves that built up around the cave's entrance. Entrance, and they began to ignite. We looked at the dry eye trap all around him. Then back to the cave where all its supplies were. Cliff's balls, he cried in, in dismay, and he took off his, his jacket, trying to use it to beat out the flames. The dead man continued trying to bite him, even as he tried to extinguish it and, and the brush around it. His jacket caught and he was forced to drop it. The fire spread quickly and Billy realized there was no way he could beat this fire. It was time to retreat. He jumped over the dead man and ran back into the cave. The smoke was thick and choking. He grabbed his pack and then turned it around again. Coughing as he went, he jumped over the uh, zombie's last pit of interval. I'll swipe at his feet and ran, looking for a stream or a river or anything. As he did, he felt an odd warmth at his back. He looked over his shoulder and saw smoke rising from his pack. Madly, he swung the pack off and then rifled through its contents, grabbing the papers before they could be harmed. He threw the pack away with a curse. He started off again, stumbling in the darkness away from the orange glow that was rising behind him. The veiler waded through waist deep water. His precious bundle held high over his head. He'd been wandering in this god forsaken swamp for days now. He hadn't seen so many leeches since the jungles in the Northlands. And this since he heard the roar of a bull crocodile. He shivered. He hadn't seen too many of the great reptiles since the end of the swamp. But he knew how powerful their jaws were. He finally made it up onto the next island. He'd been staying on land as much as possible, trying to avoid the water where he could. He wished he'd had his axe and rope. He could have put together a, a boat. It would have made this trip more pleasant. After drying off his sword and knife, he took his boots off so they'd have a chance to dry. At least a little. And began checking himself for leeches. He pulled off the four that had taken hold, cursing them as he cut them up with his knife. He placed papers on top of a reasonably dry tree stump with a rock over them to protect them from being blown away. He then and wanted to chance them getting soaked and ruined now. He checked his water skin. There was a little fresh water in it. He could start drinking it but decided to wait a little longer. He didn't know when he'd find another spring. No food, no fire, running out of water. He hoped he'd find the upper man soon or he'd have to start eating the uh, birds down to leeches. Worth a bloody place, he said. Bloody, someone said behind him in a strangely familiar voice. He turned and didn't see anyone. Place bloody, someone else said. Lorella realized the voice was his own. Am I going ing mad, he wanted to himself. Worthless, bloody, another voice said. And this time he spotted movement. A large red crab sat out from um, behind a bush. It was perhaps as tall as his knee and had long thin arms that seemed to end in spikes rather than claws. He pulled out his sword and tapped the ground, hoping to scare the creature away. That didn't look dangerous, but he didn't like the way its beady eyes were staring at him. As he stepped forward, he felt a small pain in his leg. He spun around in time to see another of the crab saddle away. Freaking bastard, he shouted. Bastard, place, worthless, said another of the crab, scudding over a rock. He started to run to it when he felt another pain, and his leg collapsed from under him. Um, he lashed at a crab that had cut at him. And with his sword, we only matched to have it with the flat blade. He got others where we read him. How many of them were there? They all began jittering, repeating his words and... An idiot chorus. He felt more pains. He he tried to fly around, but it was getting hard to move. Were they poisonous? What were they doing to him? He saw one slide up to his arm. He tried to move it out of the way, but its spike-like claw reached out, and he saw the glaring blade on its other side as it sliced into his elbow, cutting the tendon. It's out of thick, viscous liquid over the wound, sealing it instantly. He couldn't move the uh, move the arm any further. He began to scream as others swarmed over him. Cutting, spitting, rendering him immobile. 
One cut the gent and then the other's jaw and the jaw slackened. He couldn't move except to arch his back. They started cutting off bits from his extremities. He felt his fingers and toes get cut off, then one began to fluck at the off flatter of his face. The last thing you saw was a pair of sharp claws reaching down to his face. It went from for some some time until you heard an odd gutter voice. You heard your crabs cut away and then felt a final sting in his arm. He felt something lifted and carried off as he drifts off to sleep. When he woke up, he felt stiff and his head hurt. He rubbed his, his eyes as he sat up. Then he stared at his fingers and the rest of his body. He was whole. Was he in Everett's land now? Was he about to be judged? He looked around and saw that he was in a white room, lying on a padded platform. It looked like the remains of some of the sights he'd seen, though much better kept up. Something felt odd with his hands. He looked down at them and blinked several times. He counted. He counted again. He followed his fists and then opened them again. It was some use. No matter what he did, he still found he had five fingers and two thumbs on each hand. The door are opened. I see you're awake, sir. Pleased to meet you. The man looked up and nearly fell out of the platform as a monster entered the room. There was no other word for it. Huh. It was a man, roughly. It had two arms, two legs, and a head in the right places. The head was oddly formed, formed as though someone had grafted on the crown and some other heads on top of it, making it bigger than any normal man's head. He had four eyes with odd-shaped pupils under his obvious forehead. A mechanical construct on a headband is scribbled over a layer, uh, scribbled a lens over one eye, which blinked monstrously under the magnificent. Asian. The skin was paler than any man the ma paler had seen, almost white and pinkish with light brown hair. A mustache with an unnatural curve er, seemed to form a second curly Q smile under his nose. His arms branched at his elbows, giving him four large hands with long fingers with too many joints. I'm sorry if my appearance is alarming to you. I was working and I didn't expect company. You're the Everman, the beller said, frightened in spite of himself. The monster nodded. Everett Man, actually. Dr. Everett Man. The finest and the last surgeon this world has seen. And you are the beller. You talk in your sleep, you know. And scream. And beg a little. I rescued you from my pets. Dear little 00980. All nine eights. They can be difficult with strangers, I must confess, but no harm done, yes? And I even gave you a few improvements. Improvements? The extra fingers, the beller said. Yes, and if you tense your fingers just a little, the other man said, smiling in, in beautifully. That is not a word that I know of. Confused, Veller did as the other man suggested, as his fingers tensed, little glistening hooks right from the tips of his fingers. He put back a curse. They have a strong support, useful if you encounter a dingo or other wildlife. The man turned, but yes, let's have some tea. Yes, proper and civilized. Well, I followed him down the hallway, glancing around as he did, trying to get his bearings in the strange building. There were many twists and turns and many closed doors. He had voices behind some of them, but none in any language he understood. Behind some, he swore he heard moaning or weeping. 
Finally, they came to a large, spacious room, bare but for a small table in the middle of it. There were two chairs. The young man gestured to one. As Veller sat down, another door opened and a thing walked in. It was human-like, but not human. It had four legs, flew out like an insect, and it had arms that bent too many times. Its face was perfectly formed, and all the more disturbing for its apparent normality. It carried a civil over tray. It approached the table and lifted the, lifted the tray, revealing its ceramic pot with flowers painted on the side, two cups, and a bowl. The everyone took the pot and the cups, then the bowl, while placed them on the table. He poured the steaming tea into both cups. He looked at the fellow and began to ask, Would you like... Wait, no, I suppose you wouldn't know about sugar in your tea. Well, it's like honey. I'll add some for you. How's that? He took small white cubes from the bowl and placed one in each cup. The butler sipped his politely and found it tasted good. Sweeter than he was used to, but good. Thank you, he said. It's very good. He wanted to remain on the other ever man's good side. <sighs> the Everman beamed. Thank you. The refined sugar is rather clever, I think. I think I developed a grub that ex excludes it as a waste product. It took all of the better Eller's self-control to smile and swallow all rather than swing out his tea. So, he asked a trifle weakly. When you found me, did you find it? Did you by any chance find some papers? Ah, oh, yes, I wanted to discuss that with you. They are most interesting, Devman. And see in what see what was both sets of hands. Where did you find them? In a land far to the north, across half the world. They were in a situ in a vast desert. Ah, the Everman said, the Gobi outpost. That's interesting, very interesting. I did not realize that 120 was so active. We'll speak of that later. This will help me find many things that were lost. Like the location of the home site too? The Beller asked. The home... The... Everyone looked at him strangely for a moment, and then a realization dawned on his strange eyes. Ah, uh, you mean Site 23? Yes, it's in there, though. I could have told you that where that was. You could? The Valor had been so focused on papers that it occurred to him that the Everyman wouldn't need them. Though he'd come from there, too, hadn't he? Of course. It's to the west of us in a little north. I remember it well, though. I try not to visit there often. It's a dangerous place now. 184's effects are difficult to predict, especially after all this time. But think of the secrets it must hold, the Beller said. Why, it's the birthplace of humanity, the holding place of so many wonders. And the grave of Starro himself. The Everman Stiffen. His eyes narrowed. An eerie effect with all four staring down at the beller. Strodnikov, the monster said. Dmitry Aykodayevich. What? The beller said, confused.
Stranikov Dmitry Arkadyevich, the airman repeated. That's how he introduced himself to me when we, we met. It is how I have always referred to him. It is how you shall refer to him. I, yes, all right, the valor said. Saranikov Dmitry Arkadyevich? No problem. Close enough, the airman said. And yes, he is in there with 682. Grave? Perhaps a fitting tomb. Um, he was the best of us, you know. We did so well when he was with us. What happened? The valor asked, sensing the Everman wanted an audience. Yorick, the Everman said through great teeth. It was all his fault. The valor had a moment of panic, thinking to his ring, but realized it, that it was gone with the finger that he had worn it. He hurt you? He turned them all against me, the Everman said. All my friends, without Stronikov Dmitry Arkadyevich, there was no one to defend me. And after all I did, he tapped. He slammed two hands into the table with enough force to crack the wood and tip the pot and tip over the pot and the cups. I was the one who solved the D class problem. I was the one who suggested we alter the reproductive DNA. Rice may have done the work, but it was my idea. I was a doctor. I kept us all in health. I cured the diseases. I fixed the injuries. But did they remember that? No, they didn't care. They just wanted to stop my work. They said it was wrong. But I know the truth. They were jealous that I could see for either than, and, or that my hands grasped the fire. Yorick, she spat the name. He hated me ever since the Raylan instant. He should have been grateful. I was his friend. I helped him. I only ever wanted to make him better. But did he care? He turned everyone against me, cast out, no friends, no lab, nothing but my surgeon crafts to care for me. And all I ever wanted was to help people. Well, I'll show them. I'll show everyone. I'll make them better. And they'll see, and they'll thank me for it. No one will ever dare me or throw me out again. Everyone's eyes were wide and my head and veins rose from his neck. Slowly, his eyes focused again on the Beller. You... You won't leave me, will you? Yes, pleading. You're my friend. Yes. Er, yes, of course, the Beller said, terrified. The Everman was mad, clearly. If he hadn't been to start with, the years alone must have done it. Good, good. The other man said, I knew you were different as soon as I saw you. You won't abandon me. I'll... I'll help you. I'll make you... better. That's what I... that's what I'll do. Oh, that's alright, the Bella said nervously. I think I'm good enough for now. No. I insist, the other man said. He just drew a serpent which grasped the Bella with a strong vice-like grip. I understand your reluctance, but you'll see. It's for your own good. I'm your doctor, after all. He stood and walked through one of the doors. The surgeon followed, forcing Valor along. Dr. Mann pulled out a small metal object and placed it into a slot in the door, then turned it. The door opened and they entered. Valor found himself standing in a vast, as brightly lit room containing hundreds of different relics. My collection, the other man said proudly. Various SCPs, uh, wonders, I think you call them. Many. The foundation never knew 
These are just the ones that can be stored together, you understand. Others would be more problematic. He continued walking down the aisles, past shelves, boxes, and crates. A broad rimmed hat rests next to his it encrusted Ed Cup. A picture of a girl whips at him from a picture frame, sitting by a ruby medallion. A stone cube, twice as tall as a man, cracked in two. He hardly formed more than one. He hardly formed more than an impression on any of them as he was dragged and passed. They came up to a platform, like the one upon which he had woken up. Three arms of metal and plastic rose above it. Two twelve, the airman said. I was lucky to acquire it, but I should never understand it properly. The A couldn't control it. The improvements were random, haphazard. I have a better understanding. It will help you, my friend. Help you to see as I do. The Valor didn't know if he meant eyes or beliefs, and he didn't want to find out. He twisted as much as he could and delivered a swift kick right between the servant's four legs. It howled and released him even as the other men turned. The Valor grabbed a box off the his shelf. No, you fool! The other man shouted as the Valor threw the box's contents at him. He grabbed he tried to grab a tiny red object as it bounced away, but it evaded him. The Valor turned and ran. He heard crashes behind him and saw the servant running after him. Ed screamed at him, a high-pitched keening that grated the Valor's ears. And something struck the creature. And it stumbled. Valor thought he saw a tiny red streak, and then the shelf collapsed. He cursed, and at adding more speed, and at even more speed, looking for shelter. Traitor! Quisling! The Everman's voice echoed through the room. Yorick! Valor saw an odd build box. He jumped inside of it on the off chance it might be enchanted to move. He looked for some sort of control mechanism. There were several levers in the large wheel. He tried them but uh, got no noticeable response as more objects broke and shattered around him. Something put under the roof before shattering the front window. The servant, one leg trailing behind it, jumped on the front of the vehicle and reached the broken window at the Valor. In desperation, he clawed at it, breaking out the creature with the, uh, the, the uh, hooks that even had plants in his fingers. It hissed and drew its arms back, then tensed as if to jump. Finally, the valley noticed a small metal object, like the one the other man used to open the door. He grabbed it, praying to Gary and to Mary to send him somewhere safe as it twisted forward. There was a sudden and complete lack of sensation, for it's the second time the day he wondered who, if he were dead, about to face a uh, which it's just this. Then suddenly he found himself falling. He landed on a sandy dune with a force that knocked the wind from him. It is just a building half buried in sand stood, and nothing but dunes for miles. He stared, it didn't laugh, until the tears streaked down his, his face. It was a sight too, where he'd found the papers, and the whole quest had begun. And that was the first story of the Bellaverse. If you liked this video, please leave a like on the video, comment down below, and subscribe to your channel. I think the story itself gave a better tone as to what the, the canon is going to be like from here on. I want to start this because I was planning to start it after I was done with End of Death anyway, but I got a little bit tired of the End of Death.
I don't know what I'm going to be doing tomorrow, but I know I'll be here. So until then, goodbye.